One way to do a seminar is there should be at least something that everyone can understand or and then there may be some more specialized parts or so. So let's see if I can get this to go here. All right, so what is sound or what is a, a sound wave? So um, some of the earliest work was done by Boyle uh, with a spring in the air, but we really attribute a sound wave to Newton, um, who did the idea or came up with the idea that sounds a pressure pulse of fluid particles. So we have some pressure disturbance and then we have things, um, rare fractions and condensation. So, so there's a difference in pressure here and then as, as, as the pressure comes negative there, things spread apart. As the pressure comes there, you push things together and you've got a propagation of a, a sound wave. So Newton came up with this idea. Um, others, Lord Rayleigh, uh, had contributed to it once, once it was kind of established. So we might remember from our basic uh, physics course, uh, what is a wave, or, or which isn't completely trivial, but we might know or remember two types of wave. A transverse wave is perpendicular. Its displacement is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Uh, if you took a slinky and then swung it up and, uh, up, up and down, you'd get a transverse wave. And then if you took that slinky instead and crunched it up and then let it go, you'd have a longitudinal wave. So its displacement is parallel to its direction of propagation there. So this longitudinal wave is actually how sound propagates. It's a longitudinal wave. Your pressure may oscillate sinusoidally, but the sound propagates um, in a longitudinal flash in there. So one question you ask students, um, and you may think it's trivial, but it's actually not completely trivial exactly. What is a wave? And we've seen these things too, maybe at football games or so, uh, where people started to come up and do a wave. Um, so where's the origin of the wave? So actually the origin of the wave is at University of Washington. Um, that's where I went to graduate school. And they have, uh, they started at the football stadium there. Uh, students in, in the early 70s uh, started doing the wave. So University of Washington, particularly for medical acoustics and physical acoustics and ocean acoustics, which I'm all interested in, that's one of the leading uh, spots to go to grad school or do research there. Um, and then this is another place is University of Texas at Austin, which is kind of the competition. Um, and this is from a professor who's a, who um, uh, is at University of Austin, David Blockstack. So he has a book about waves, a graduate level book, and he has some good thoughts here. So a wave has some characteristics. It's a deviation or disturbance from a pre-existing condition. Time plays a role. Actual movement takes place at a finite speed. Mechanical waves require a medium. If you do electromagnetic waves, you're an EE or study that, it can go through a vacuum. Gross movement is not required. And the idealization is a wave equation. So we have a linear wave equation, but actually in acoustics, there are nonlinear wave equations and more complicated um, situations there. It isn't always just a linear uh, wave equation. Um, so some students uh, and even graduate students seem to think that everything is just a linear wave equation. And that's not quite the story there. The other thing is, is too, is you may see perfect sinusoids and we use those as examples, but the disturbance doesn't have to be oscillatory. If you have a pulse or a spike, those are also very valid and important uh, waveforms. So this carries at some finite speed or so. So how do we characterize what that speed of sound is? So we can characterize it for, for medium, air, water and materials. So the longitudinal speed is the bulk modulus, kind of like you buy things in bulk at Costco, you have some bulk, it's related to volumetric deformation over some density. So this works for, for air, water, and steel. And as we see in air, it's about, it depends on temperature there in these quantities, but in air, it's about 340 or so meters per second at room temperature. Water's about 1500, some variations with salinity or seawater and temperature. And then steel is about 5,000 or so. And uh, solids, as you learned in your solids course, they don't just have a longitudinal wave. You can get a shear wave um, that propagates, and you can also get waves on the surface, rally waves and love waves. So those are also, also acoustics. I've done some work in that. I won't talk quite as much about that in this talk, but wave propagation in solids is also important uh, for such applications as saw devices and uh, non-destructive testing. Okay, so the other thing we learn, or, or I think some EEs have a better job of understanding this, um, and mechanical engineers uh, need to know this too. So Alexander Graham Bell uh, developed the telephone, and actually he wasn't trying to develop the telephone, he was trying to help deaf people hear. His wife was deaf, 
And then Helen Keller was deaf and blind. She was a little younger than his wife, but he also had some, some uh, interaction with her. So you may have heard of this decibel scale. So Bell comes after Alexander Graham Bell. We shorten it just B-E-L. So it's the log of something over some reference or something standard. So that's what a bell is. Deci is 10. So that's 10 log something over something standard or something reference. So you may have seen these scales or, or heard people in 140, some undergrad students um, doing some grinding and other devices and say, ooh, what's pretty loud or so? What is that scale or decibel scale? So you may have heard about it, but that's not the full story. Um, and we're gonna get a little bit more in the full story. So how do you define this uh, decibel scale or so. So what do you use for acoustics? Well, you can use different quantities, but in acoustics, we particularly look at intensity level, of the sound wave, um, some average value over some reference value for intensity. And then you can do things in terms of voltage and current, but in acoustics, we also look at pressure. So SPL, sound pressure level, is some RMS value there of a quantity and then 20 log RMS P over P reference. And we know what P reference is, or it's pretty much established for air and water um, that we do a lot of um, research or know a lot about. So why use this logarithmic scale? It seems like a bit of a extra thing that's kind of makes it confusing, but the whole idea is even if you're just looking at human hearing, we can hear things and they get painful, a shock wave or other things up to like a hundred Pascals, so pressure there. But we can also hear rustling of weaves and the fre threshold of human hearing way down here. So there's such a range of scales that we want something uh, that will cover that here. So this is a huge range, but it's also within the realm of human hearing. So we look at a dB or a logarithmic scale uh, for acoustics. So the other quantity we talked about is a wave. It has some wavelength and then some frequency. So um, you may be familiar with these uh, quantity uh, uh, properties here. So the wavelength of meter, if it's something is about 500 Hertz, it's about 0.66 meters. That's half a meter, a little more than half a meter. A meter is about the length of a yard or a lightsaber as I tell students. And then uh, a thousand uh, Hertz is about 0.3, half of that or so. So these are kind of physical quantities in size uh, that we have some feeling for. And we notice as we get up in frequency, uh, we have more cycles per second and we have a smaller wavelength. So that affects a lot of applications in terms of diffraction, um, image resolution, penetration and attenuation. Those things depend on frequency. So as you go up in frequency, you have more and more wavelengths and then um, uh, uh, the wavelength is smaller as you have more and more uh, in, in, in the cycle. So what is this frequency or frequency range for acoustics? So there's a range we can hear, which is about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And then there's things below that um, that are acoustics, seismic vibrations, earthquakes, those are called infrasound. And then we have things we study in medical and in underwater acoustics and um, non-destructive testing that are above 20 kilohertz. And those are called ultrasound. So dogs and some other animals here higher than us. And then as we get older, uh, we you tend to lose our hearing, but it tends to be at the high end of our hearing. So as you get older, you lose that. You're no longer hearing up to 20 kilohertz. You're gonna be around 17 or 16. The hearing range for young, is longer or so, but over time you lose this, your hair cells um, um, uh, you know, can be destroyed or limited in your hair cells and uh, they don't grow back or so. And then there's a range for other things we may be interested in, jet noise, cricket noise or so, uh, and then uh, musical instruments. So musical instruments, the piano is one of the things that covers the range of frequencies here. And then uh, voices go from bass to soprano and then the other thing uh, too is the size of the instrument also depends on its wavelength. So a cello is bigger than a violin. Um, they kind of have a similar design there, but uh, you notice for the cello, it goes down a lower frequency. So in some length, the wave, lowest wavelength an instrument can generate is based on size. So, and you can see that there's also another instrument, the double bass, which is bigger than the cello and it has a longer frequency range. So we have something in terms of our frequency, we hear, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And then in between this range, there's musical instruments and there's different applications and different ranges of noise. 
So this is a good slide, and these are from Michael Erdman here, who teaches at Virginia Tech. And just for this introduction, um, I think I'm, I'm using some of his slides. So it's a little bit of a, uh, a misconception that this is 20 dB, this is 30 dB. It actually depends on our frequency on what we hear. So there's a frequency dependence on the sound pressure level. So these curves right here are curves of equal loudness. So if you're at uh, 2000 Hertz rustling of leaves, we hear rustling of leaves, um, but if we hear the pounding surf, the, the same level of what we have in terms of our loudness level, we need to be about 60 dB for these low frequency pounding uh, surf to have the same as rustling of leaves. So anywhere on this curve is based on equal loudness or equal loudness contours. And you can see where things are there. And these dip right here is usually related to human speech. So we've kind of evolved or, or uh, to have such that we are most likely to perceive human speech. So you can imagine cavemen in the early days, they wanted to hear a whisper about something. So we've, we have this dip here. So it doesn't take much of a whisper uh, at this range of 4,000 Hertz to hear something. Um, but you need a much higher amount of sound pressure level to be equivalent at this low end here. And then you get to a certain level there where this is our threshold of pain. We no longer hear things, but it just becomes painful. Police siren, you may have heard the fire sirens yesterday, uh, air raid siren, rock band, chainsaw, these are things there. And then music has a range in here. Um, there. And then toilet flushing and some other things. So he has a pretty nice idea there. There's no um, coincidence, constants fall from the frequencies where most human hearing is most sensitive there. So there's a threshold of hearing and it depends on the frequency or sound pressure level. So this is actually what's used in um, architectural um, acoustics and uh, room acoustics or so like that, you look at that frequency level. So if you look at a sound meter, there's a dB level, but there's also a weighting. So what is this dBA thing? This means it's weighted to account essentially for these contours there uh, of human uh, hearing. So these are called fletcher munson curves and the dBA weighting it, uh, corrects for this frequency. So, so um, that's what the dBA uh, level has that. So this is what they do in architectural acoustics. So um, I guess we may merge with the School of Architecture and uh, most architectural schools I know or, or um, big ones, they also have someone who specializes in architectural acoustics. It's usually not quite as um, uh, mathematical. It's, uh, they do some things close to civil or so. So Michael Ehrman, who I know, he says, John, you gotta use my book. I mean, it's a little too qualitative, uh, but we use some of the slides there. He's at Virginia Tech. And they do things that are very practical too. So there's a sound level, this DBA level, and then there's a percentage of people that get annoyed. How he calculated this, I don't know exactly, but they apparently do that there. So if you have trains, they get up to a certain level, roads, aircraft, wind turbines, we're interested in wind energy, 30% of the people around will be annoyed or so. So we're gonna merge with um, perhaps our architecture there. So that will be interesting or so, but you know, we can get the concepts. I think in engineering, it's not gonna be too hard, especially in mechanical engineering. Things get to a certain level and then you know, a certain percentage of people get annoyed or so. So, so it's, it's more qualitative, but um, there is some interesting things in architectural acoustics. So we're not quite done with the frequency story here. What, what else is the frequency, Kenneth? That was a, a a song you might remember or so. So other things are based when we, just for basic engineering understanding of acoustics is this idea of an octave. And we actually get this idea of an octave from music or so, sound of music, do, re, mi, fa, so. And then um, um, Mankin, who's a professor in India is quick to point out that re is the only one in the Indian tone that is the same. They also call it re, and then they have some other ones, I, I don't know or something, but if you look in his textbook, uh, he points out there's an Indian uh, version of that. And I think in India, they have some ones we don't have in between these tones. So the idea of an octave, if you've seen a musical instrument, um, a standard octave is twice. So you have F2 is two to some power. In the case of a standard octave is just one F1. So that was, you go to C, middle C here to C there. So that's the idea of an octave. And you can see that here. What we also use in acoustics is one third power octave. So F2 is two to the one third F1. And those ones are uh, highlighted there in bold or so. So those are one third octave standards. So if you see things in music or just any engineering 
uh, noise or standard engineering stuff in mechanical, civil, electric engineering. You look at octave, octave bands, a band width, a range of frequencies, and then one third band octaves are used. So this is kind of uh, also from Erdman's book or so. So even in architectural acoustics, they need to know some signal processing or some idea there. So you have a waveform and here it's idealized as pure tone and you have some spectrum. So you have some frequency and then you can look at third band octave resolution, full octave band X resolution, and then full uh, octave band resolution with some A weighting. So what is this little chop off A weighting thing here is the fact that we won't he hear every frequency the same. So this corrects for those Fletcher Munson curves. Then you can have something simple here. You have harmonics. Um, uh, this is, you can just see this here. There's these higher frequencies superimposed over this lower frequency there. So that would be um, the harmonics there. And then you can look at these octave band resolutions. Complex sounds like noise tend to be spread over a range of frequencies. And if it's truly random noise or so, we describe it by a PDF. So you learn this in your course or so. So a standard thing is a Gaussian. Not all noises do follow a Gaussian. Um, we also look at noise within certain band, uh, pink noise or so. So it's not, not the Pink Panther, it's usually some band limit of a noise. And then we also have things where we have non-Gaussian distributions or PDFs that we look at in uh, acoustics, particularly the chi distribution is one that pops up for some applications. So the same kind of idea, you have complex sounds and you can relate them into their frequencies. So this is a lot of what acoustics is in terms of the signals. Of course, there's much fancier uh, things to do. Um, electrical engineers specialize a lot in that if they do acoustics, but then this, you know, even if you're doing architectural acoustics or biological acoustics, you need to know the standard things or so. So what are we going to talk about for uh, research and what kind of things I'm going to highlight here. So um, some of the things I, I've done and um, uh, plan to continue to do um, in the upcoming uh, year or so more of is underwater acoustics. So you're looking for things underwater. You want to find things that perhaps shouldn't be there. You want to know what they are, classify them, and then you may want to track them. Where are those things going? Uh, the other area we'll look at too is the invasive species. So this is the uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, it's very devastating and I worked with Dan Jenkins, as I said, um, in CTAR on this uh, project and uh, stopped after sabbatical, what may continue. Medical acoustics, I won't walk, uh, talk quite as much about, but I'll mention briefly. And then some of the things I did on my sabbatical was cavitation uh, work and a few other um, things on physical acoustics, which is basically a uh, basic study of sound propagation, um, in solids, fluids, things like drops, uh, bubbles, how they interact with sound or using sound to manipulate them. Uh, those, those types of things, material propagation, phonons, uh, those are really the core of, you need to know these equations and then some part of these equations go to these different areas of acoustics. So this is Robert Lindsay, who's a physics professor at Brown. He's passed away, but he kind of came up with this chart and everyone uses it. So, in some ways you go to different meetings, but in some ways I go to the same meeting, the Acoustical Society of America, and I just have to walk over to a different room and then I see some of the people in the same area. So I do know a lot of people in architectural acoustics, which I don't do, uh, and musical acoustics, it's more of a hobby or side interest, uh, personal you know, interest, but you know, you can walk over and meet these people there too. And then bioacoustics, IEEE, UFFC, which I'm also involved to, to a lesser extent, and AIUM, American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. Those are other societies that are more specialized, but the ASA still has a bioacoustics medical part. And then animal acoustics and ocean acoustics, the ASA is just the society. There really isn't a competing society or uh, another society that, at the level of, of participation and, and interest. Okay, so um, biomedical acoustics, this is a separate uh, talk that I'm happy to give. And uh, I did a little work on sabbatical and actually had uh, um, more funding uh, previously on this. This is still an area of interest and perhaps some the most uh, well-known or papers are the most no well-known in biomedical acoustics. So um, typically you're interested in finding things uh, that shouldn't be there like tumors or so. And then also you can make images or so. So this is the uh, acoustic optical system I have in my lab. Uh, we do some high frequency scanning and imaging there uh, of biomaterials. These are um, plaque based um, 
staining with plaque, but also acoustic image superimposed on an optical image. So I am actively involved over sabbatical and now over the past few years on study sections. So um, SBIRs in particular, I've worked with had a little some money here since Hawaii, um, but uh, you know I've been active with people who have started SBIRs, STIRs, and um, and some work has been of, of note. So I've, I've been um, asked and been on study sections for SBIRs and STIRs. So these are usually biomedical startup companies, and I'm in the section for imaging and sensing. So I do get some acoustics, but there's also infrared imaging and other things. So those are you know if you can get an SBIR phase one, it's 300,000, 200, 300. Uh, second phase is much harder. It's up to, you know, I've seen things up to 2 million or so. Um, and, uh, you know, these are, these are competitive and also very interesting. So, and I'm also on this other study section here for uh, CRSR R15. So Hawaii doesn't have as many SBIRs. I think there's a lot in Seattle, which is the big ultrasound center. Uh, I think some of my former group people are part, all part of that dot. And then, of course, California has a lot, and actually more in San Diego. But, um, you know, th those are good things to be involved with, and, and it's good for the college. So what kind of things have I looked at or done in terms of ocean acoustics? And this works uh, uh, a few years old, but uh, since we may be getting the Kilinalo study area back for ocean acoustics, uh, I want to mention some of these things here, or some uh, students had mentioned they were interested in ocean acoustics or so. So you need to put things underwater for ocean acoustics, and usually you put more than one sensor. There's a limit to what you can do with one sensor. So you put things that are arrays, uh, acoustic arrays, which are hydrophones, and how they're spaced and how they're shaped becomes uh, an interesting uh, part of the research and uh, you can listen for things. You can also transmit and listen for things, but if you want to listen for things just passive acoustics, um, then uh, it's sometimes very hard to hear them. So part of the underwater acoustics problems are you want to find something that's not supposed to be there um, potentially, um, but then there's a lot of things around that are supposed to be there like ships or so, and then how do you find that specific thing? And then once you've found that specific thing, how do you know what it is? And then the other thing too is, can you find out where it's going? Um, so this involved a lot of diving. At one time they called me up to the diving office and they said, who are you? You're doing more diving than anyone in the university um, for filling out a dive plan. So you can't just have random people dive. It has to be a dive plan and there's all these regulations um, for doing. And I had gotten out of diving since I was in doing it more when I was in high school or so. And there's rebreather divers, which don't make bubbles, which we needed for our study. Um, and there's only five people certified on the whole island and there's different levels of certification. So, so um, Dave Pence called me up, but fortunately I was working with uh, Tim Trekus, who's a biologist or so, who's on the dive board and Gino Pollock, who was running the Kilinalo part, who's on the dive board or so. So to do these things, you need a boat, you need a ship. It's not trivial to do. Uh, these levels of deployments. But once you get the data set, we got two of these data sets there, you know, you have several years worth of data, or you don't have several years worth of data, and then you have no more funding, but you try to publish something. So this is my array. This is a postdoc from Australia who is certified in diving, who works for free. This is one guy I paid, and then I had uh, pro bono work or just favors because I couldn't afford everything. Other people die for free for me doing favors and stuff. So it's, it's an expensive proposition or so, uh, to do some of these things if you want to put things underwater. The Vange is if you can get data no one else can get, but then you can also um, uh, not get anything. So uh, the, for the, we had an array, which is all these 24, two arrays of 24 hydrophones cabled there. So it has power um, and you have to put them down. And, and this is not even a very, you know, far off area, but there's a lot of work in doing that. You need a ship and things like that. So we, we got by on a very limited budget or so. So each of these deployments cost about 50K or so, but that really was um, uh, me penny pinching or so. So what do you, what do you want to find or what do we want to do? There is um, one of the number one technologies people are interested in getting uh, is the AUV technology. So no one had really uh, done a, a study of could you track that or could you find that and that's what we did here so there's a, uh, a method you can use for two hydrophones if it's a broadband source called cross correlation but and people have reported that they had tracked these things but in fact they were really not tracking the sound of the underwater um, uh, vehicle they were just tracking its modem 
So you notice it disappears here. So this method is good for broadband sources, but these aren't broadband sources. Ships are broadband sources, but um, people didn't quite realize that these remises, these are vehicles. Um, we have one, I think it's now in UC San Diego. Uh, Gino took it there. Um, uh, these are you know, about a million dollars. I think it was 1.2 million. So they're not trivial things there. And we were able to track, this is on the order of meters here, um, using these arrays and we're able to track. So this is actually the track, the GPS track, and then we use beamforming and we find this track. So there's different ways in EE you may know about beamforming. This is what I worked on initially was delay and slum, but collaborators who help with this deployment, again, on the budget of this deployment, uh, looked at it with some adaptive methods and there's fancier methods to do. But for you basically get this track, this is the Remus, this is the ship we don't want, this is GPS track, and then we baselined it here. And we did simulations for that. So um, some, most of this work's been published in JAZA or IEEE uh, Oceans, and I can refer it to the, you there. So we have some work on boat localization and tracking where you just use two hydrophones and you wanna break an ambiguity surface with those two hydrophones. When you have less hydrophones, it's hard to know if it's on one side of the ray or ever. And we used an inversion method, an acoustic inversion method, which wasn't trivial uh, to show that this is the actual track or so. So that's some very nice work um, actually led um, by one of my collaborators, PhD student, but I um, participated a quite a, um, you know, a lot in the experiment and actually kind of formulating that problem. Ambient noise characterization, I had a student, a master student work on this, how it changes with respect to the daylight, the time and locations there. Uh, detection and clutter using multi-scale entropy. Uh, where is the ship in here? When is, this, when is it a ship or not a ship? And we were able to get some results there. Uh, this is, well, I have some conferences on this. This has all been in journal articles. This uh, is still something that's conferences. And then some follow-up studies at the end, we were looking at things if ships were frozen. We had collaborators in Alaska or so. How do you look at the uh, ice fracture and acoustic emissions? We use some infrared um, thermography, and this has been actually of interest to some people um, and, in NASA, and they contacted me when I was in sabbatical about doing something there. Um, um, nothing's quite happened yet, but um, there may be some possibilities. Okay, so I did work with undergrads or so. So um, I worked with, I undergrads, in, one undergrad in ME, Jonathan Shinnan, who went to UCLA uh, in mechanical engineering, uh, two, student, two or three students in E, uh, some students in zoology, uh, and then so, uh, one, a couple students in art or so. I worked on this project and other things because they're just good at photography. So uh, one of the things we did, which students are interested in at that time, there were no rules for the state of Hawaii. There were no rules for uh, the University of Hawaii. There were no rules whatsoever for drones. So I got one of the first drones um, uh, on the island and people didn't even know what it was. And um, we started to get some people to fly it. So uh, Galen, who's a professor in EE, said, oh, well, you're not gonna be able to get a student to do MATLAB what you like, John because they all get taken up by Aaron and Wayne. But you could get this Bradley guy who's actually a pilot and um, he's this EE student and he's you know trained to be a pilot and he could help fly the drone. So he did do that. Um, um, and uh, we were able to get some nice video here of the drone. What we're doing here is trying to look and see if we could relate this bubble wake with some simulations and calculations there and the acoustic sound uh, for different classification schemes. So it's actually uh, to do the whole thing. We got some interesting data. Uh, it was an undergrad project, so I wasn't quite as um, stressed about getting it publishable or so, but we, you know, I presented this uh, at a meeting um, and we've got some interesting things. So there are some interesting things to do there um, with combining optical uh, acoustics there. And we didn't have an IR camera, but that's another interesting thing because these wakes are stabilized um, by surfactants or so. So there's some interesting stuff there. And, and at that time, um, there were no rules for drones. You could fly them and do whatever you wanted with them. Okay, so uh, what are, what's future plans for that? So I didn't get to Australia. I was invited uh, by a collaborator and a friend of mine um, who is at uh, Swinburne University and has a joint appointment at University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, a big place, his center, he has a center which is kind of his own lab, he calls it a center or so. So he does a lot of work in particularly um, some ocean acoustics bubble stuff, which I know him from, but then wave acoustics and um, uh, things with wave energy. And he brings in a lot of um, good work and then publishes a lot of good work. He has some nice JFM articles 
on bubbles uh, too. So there's a good balance of applied stuff and and um, funding and and uh, you know very theoretical uh, stuff too. So I didn't get to Australia, but I was invited to go to Melbourne, and I was going to actually go this last summer, which is their winter. But we had the COVID thing, so I'm st we wrote some grants that were almost funded, three, and one was almost funded, but um, actually. Uh, it just missed the deadline. So, so that's still a collaboration I hope to uh, continue there. And he came and visited once here to, um, uh, to Hawaii a few years ago. So the other project that's a, a, a practical one that I got involved with, um, Dan Jenkins, who's a colleague in, uh, of mine in CTAR said, John, you gotta help me with this or, 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 or can you get involved with this? And, and, and um, I said, yeah, sure, sure. And he says, there's not much money, but uh, you can, we can see what we can do as a starting project. So there was a lot of money, but uh, not on our end to do some of these things. So this is the coconut rhinoceros beetle. Uh, people believe it came from Guam in a military uh, cargo plane or United flies to Guam on its way to Hong Kong and then it snuck on there. So uh, why is this of interest? So they first found it there uh, here. Um, this was 214, they found one. Uh, this is landscape technology today. And they said, oh, there's one, don't worry about it. But actually it, it started showing up on the golf courses and then some of the higher ups in the military said, what are these things doing on the golf course? Uh, they're interrupting my golf game. So then they started to look at it more seriously. And then they found in fact, you know, this could be a very serious problem. So this is Guam here. So you can't get rid of it in Guam. It's eating up all the palm trees there in Guam. And then the concern too is if it's in Hawaii and it went to California or snuck on there and started eating all the citrus fruits and other things, it would be very, very devastating to uh, the economy of the US, not, not just alone Hawaii's economy. Now we have COVID, but uh, people wanna come here. We don't want the devastation of our agriculture. So um, this is its stage here. It's an adult and then it's this uh, grub and then this pupa there. And then it hides underground and then it only flies at night. And then it, at night it goes and then they feed and burrow and then they go back and they stay here for a while and then they go back uh, underground. And no one knows where they go underground or so. That's why it's so devastating to Guam. Uh, because you know they fly and no one knows. They've done a little GPS tracking now in Guam, but you know only a couple beetles. So we wanted to see with this uh, project. Uh, there were two parts to it. Um, uh, one a little bit more scientific, which I'll highlight there. But one is, did they make sounds underground? And we found they actually do. Um, this hadn't been reported before. This is a chirp sound. This is a spectrogram frequency versus time. And you had these things that are, as I mentioned before, that are like harmonics or so. So. We did find they did chirp underground and we kind of wanted to set up some system there when they do chirp, but we found when then they're in uh, some of these um, porous medium or substrates or burying the tree, if they're in a mulch pile, you might be able to get some of it, but if they're in the tree, you're going to get a signal like this. So we've been working instead of getting like a standard microphone signal, there's so much noise when they're chewing in the tree, you'd have to use something like a contact microphone. So this measures vibrations or so, and you would look at those vibrations and you would build something up and go to the tree. And this is something I want to continue with Dan or Dan has contacted me since I back to sabbatical. You make these sensors and then you look for vibrations vibrations in the tree to see if you can find something there. And these are ones from the log. Uh, under in the mulch pile, you may be able to see this, but if they're in this uh, kind of more um, uh, rigid tree environment, you're not going to get these uh, signals here. So this was in a mulch pile or so, or you find them in a mulch pile, you put acoustic detectors on there and you put out these things and you see if you can find them hidden in their mulch pile. The other thing that was more interesting uh, to me um, uh, was looking at uh, tracking or understanding their uh, wing beat acoustics. So uh, they flew around the room, they're in a quarantine area here, and we finally found you could put them on a magnet there so they wouldn't fly around or do things in the room. Up here, I guess this is one that escaped from the Department of Agriculture when we visited it there. So ah, there it is. <laughs> so uh, they I do have a quarantine area in the, the Department of Agriculture, but uh, we found a few when we visited there to do some of the initial measurements, uh, they did escape. Uh, we saw some escape there. So this was the setup um, we did in the quarantine room. It's in St. John. And like I said, you can't just go in there. You have like three levels of security um, uh, to go through. You have to have special people with you and then you have special locks and this and that or so because um, they don't want, it's like alien. They don't, they have a whole colony of these things and then they don't want them escaping. 
Um, so uh, this is our initial setup in the quarantine room. We use a microphone array, kind of like only four microphones, but similar to the idea of an acoustic array there. This is our tethered one. And then Dan Jenkins is an expert at making sensors for plants and agricultural things. That's his uh, strength there. He expert at sensors. So he reproduced this optic acoustic sensor that they had published uh, in PLOS, uh, a group at UC Irvine. So we wanted to compare the wing beat detection from different angles with the uh, acoustics, which is much cheaper than the special sensor because the sensor has to fly through or so like that. So we want to baseline this sensor for traps as well as some acoustics and compare the things there. And it took us uh, a month, uh, two months, and then we didn't get them to fly. So then we finally figured, oh, well, they only fly at night. So then we have to heat them up or let them be at night there to finally get them to fly. And they still didn't fly. But if you twist this a little bit, it seems very trivial there. Uh, we could get it to fly or so like that. So turning off the lights and getting it to heat up. So they need to get to a certain body temperature. It's a little bit of a misnomer that they're cold blooded. So Amy Moran, who's a colleague of mine, she's a thermal biologist. She said, John, they have to warm up, you know, to fly. I said, oh, yes, of course, they have to warm up to fly. Um, so we were able to figure that out. Um, and uh, then we got some data here. But to get the high-speed camera, you got to turn on the light because you can't really get anything here. So you got to turn on the light to actually get some wings. It's a little, you know, and then you have them tethered. But, uh, you know, biology, you get the data you can get. Um, so these are the things we started to get. Uh, and no one had quite seen this before, seen it for this species of a coconut rhinoceros beetle. So some people have done some different types of beetles. There's an Asian rhinoceros beetle in Japan and people use as a pet. Uh, but this is some of the uh, wing beats there. And these guys only fly at night when they have to. This isn't so aerodynamic. There's a question on why they have that there. And their wing beat pattern and this relationship between this and this upper part um, are, are uh, kind of unique there. So this is kind of the idea that we synced it with the microphone and looked at some of the microphone uh, signals of those. This microphone wasn't calibrated or, or has a not an individual calibration or so, but you can go to voltage. So you can measure voltage and then you can go back to pressure or so. So these are some of the spectrograms and lining it up there. Uh, with, with the microphone or so. And then we had the microphones from the different parts with the array. Uh, you can detect it because it's fairly close, but we wanted to figure out uh, the different parts of the acoustic sounds uh, from that. Okay, so we want to see if what we're doing is right to compare to that optical sensor that Dan made or people had reported in PLOS on wing beat and to see if how anything else does it. So in biology, they tend to use do more scaling relationships or so. If you even read nature papers or science paper in biology, they want to look at things scale. So one relationship they have is the frequency of the wing beat scales as the square root of the mass over um, the, the uh, area uh, in the frontal area of actually the wing. So these are different beetles that you do see here. We have this guy and this guy, coconut rhinoceros beetle. So they have a different mass and they should have a different wing beat. So we looked at that, we have better data now. Um, this is from a year or two ago before I was in sabbatical, but we tend to fit this wing beat frequency scaling. Uh, there isn't a lot out there and some of the data is suspect, but we are, uh, this is our data point, and I talked to the woman who collected this data. I started her conference, and she goes, oh, yeah, you're using my data, so you must be right. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we're confident it's there, and we have a little bit more um, statistics on this one, but um, we do have some confidence that both both detectors are working for getting the wing beat. The optical uh, detector doesn't get the harmonics correctly, or what we believe are the harmonics from acoustics, and then whether you're in the back or front, you do get some variation um, of what you're detecting um, for, for with acoustics and there's some subtle signal processing we can talk about otherwise if you want to talk about that one. So uh, we also wanted to look at the uh, oriental flower beetle uh, which has a different um, body size and length there and um, this is the sound pressure level and it has some frequencies. It's smaller and if you look at the scaling the coconut rhinoceros beetle tends to be around 50 or 60 hertz, a little bit higher for females uh, depends on their size, but these ones you may see around, um, we had to collect these, they're hard to collect, but we got samples of, of 20 of these, which is apparently a, a big breakthrough. Uh, you know, they're around 100 fundamental, and then this spectra there, these are the harmonics which generated there, 200, 300. So you do use spectra, you know, for all acoustics things and looking at their sources. So these are um, the oriental, I don't know if they're commonly mistaken, but they are a comparison there. 
So we've lo done some things looking at their spectra, detection of their spectra. I presented this um, for lower frequency, looking at spectrograms, doing some adaptive signal processing. Uh, this is a method that's kind of standard. We use in biomedical acoustics and other things uh, for non-stationary signals uh, and looking at energy there. So can you, we, the Fourier transform is based on stationarity. So you only take thing over uh, time window and you don't know when these guys happened or so and you lose phase information. Uh, the spectrogram gives us time information or so, so we have something with frequency and time and intensity, but it's still based on linearity between uh, the, uh, um, you know, on the signal has some linearity to it. So there are fancier ways to do it. You can look at bispectra, which you get phase information between these peaks, and I've done that before for uh, ocean acoustics, for waves a little bit, and a lot more for biomedical acoustics or physical acoustics, for bubbles, or you can, um, another method besides the, that is you can actually do a decomposition or so, a standard one is the EMD, and you can look at these IMFs and get instantaneous phase and frequency, or like we were doing just a ratio. So when you have non-stationary signals, the non-linearity of this isn't a big deal, but non-stationarity is a important uh, part. So um, I presented this uh, at an entomology meeting and then Dan presented once at more of like a pest control meeting or so. And then I got more interested in the basic science or so. So I wanted to see uh, a little bit more on how this uh, fluid mechanics uh, relates to the wing beat. And I presented this at the um, APS meeting, uh, DFD, and apparently uh, they, it was well received. So I do have one, uh, JFM and Cambridge University Press interviewed me there's a YouTube, so I was surprised I got that level of press. Apparently, this is really nice data, and people said, well, John, you got to try to publish this or, or or get this into a good journal. I said, okay, I'll send it to JFM. They said, no, no, you're not sending it in without any, any simulations or anything. Um, so, I wanted to see what could be done on this. So, there is some work on flapping thing uh, wing aerodynamics. Uh, these are um, uh, some of the things that have been studied, less so these beetles. And there is some work on aeroacoustics. I actually was going to visit um, Davenport. Uh, he's kind of a, a grumpy guy, but he's at Virginia Tech. I didn't get to him, but he's kind of a leader in this. But they don't do any insects there. And there are some Korean researchers in JASA that actually have done a, a good thing for the bumblebee based on some CFT simulations or so. So I'll present more about this afterwards. So they said to get in a good journal, you need some simulations or more theory. So there is things I started to do with aeroacoustics, but I think the level of complexity of the uh, beetle, it's it's not just a monopole dipole source or so. So, so I've been working uh, with two groups, and this group or so has actually been more productive. Um, this is a, a guy who has a company um, who does CFD, who's also has a joint appointment at a university. So we've been taking these and digitizing these, and this is something I want to try to get uh, some more funding for, more fundamental than Dan's funding because they're more interested in just killing the beetle. Um, uh, on understanding this. So this is not trivial to do. And it and uh, uh, so just going flapping like this symmetrically is fairly easy to do, but to actually get the bending of the wing and this uh, contour of the up and down stroke, um, we were are starting to get some things and then the membrane, but we're still in the end compressible regime or weekly. It's, it's very hard to get some compressibility in there, which you need for acoustics. So this is ongoing work I can talk more about later. I'm not doing all the simulations, but I'm certainly interactive in developing it uh, with my uh, collaborator there. So um, uh, whatever kind of things did I do uh, for sabbatical? So um, I uh, uh, visited Eric or interacted with Eric is a, a professor at um, Belmont University and also has a joint appointment at Vanderbilt. Uh, he does things with more musical acoustics or audio acoustics and I was going to use his book and uh, for teaching acoustics. Um, he's more electrical engineer but it's a good book and he was going to come and visit me this coming spring. I think it's going to be delayed or because uh, for sabbatical because of COVID. And he does more things in audio kind of educational things, but I thought that was good to visit with him and, and uh, try to collaborate there. Um, I have an abstract coming up in the uh, next acoustical meeting with people I know from the Journal of uh, Vibration Acoustics. So most of the acoustics I do is the Acoustical Society of America. But there are people who do audio acoustics like Eric, who also do Acoustic Society America, but they do more, you know, making uh, systems, sound systems, uh, musical things, recording music, uh, 
uh, making loudspeakers, kind of very applied stuff, but um, you know, it's it's more audio engineering. It's less science, and it's less more specialized scientific or basic physics. But you know, very very interesting too. And then there are people who do more noise and vibrations, kind of competing in the ASME. So I've been associate editor of this journal, ASA. Um, I was asked, but I turned it down a, a while ago because um, I was busy with. The ocean acoustics project but this one i, I did take up because of um it's good to get some representation here uh as the people i know uh, the editor of that journal the uh, editor-in-chief and some of the other people uh, um two people i started to collaborate a little bit um and we have some things there um on aeroacoustics it's aeroacoustics of turbines they didn't want to mess with the beetles there and um, um some other types of uh, a little bit more applied engineering things we hope to get funded for Okay, so what else did I do? I guess I have a few minutes le left. The other place I visited was um, um, uh, the Splash Lab, which is in Utah, um, run by a colleague I know from uh, more fluid mechanics or, or DFD meetings, uh, Tad Trescott, who um, uh, does, does more water entry or impact sounds, or he doesn't look at the sounds, but he looks more at the high-speed visualization. And he has fancier cameras than I do. I have one camera that's a little dated, but I do a lot more acoustics, but he has some other cameras, and then he's interested in these splashes. And these are things he studied or people studied, liquid, liquid, solid, uh, liquid, solid, solid. So um, we wanted to do something that people had done before and something we could detect acoustically. And I had thought about this for some other ideas. And these are some variations of what people have done. The particular thing that he does a lot of, which he's published in Nature Comms and, and Nature Physics, is these hydrophobic surfaces. So here you have this con change of contact angle. You have a coating here and they're secret, but now I know his secret coatings. Um, you have this here, and this kind of has some, it repels things on the surface there. So this is what we looked at, and um, people had studied some of these things, and we have this data set, which I took first or so. So droplet on droplet, and it lifts off there, and you get some instability. So that's one data set I'm working on. Uh, with him uh, to publish. We have two data sets. And then the solid droplet wasn't quite as interesting for the hydrophobic. So what we started looking at um, based on some some of my motivation and then also what, what was uh, uh, available for a viscoelastic material was this water bead. So this is different than the solid sphere or the droplet on droplet or so. So we do see something quite different in terms of its breakup. So um, I uh, brought one of my contact microphones and then I had to buy another one or get one custom made. And then we use my uh, calibrated uh, ultrasonic frequency or range frequency air microphone. And then uh, we, we generalized one of his setups in the anechoic chamber. So we had to do this in an anechoic chamber, which doesn't have any sound to actually get some of these things there. The problem was his high speed camera, which goes 100,000 frames a second actually has a fan in there, noise. So there's a little bit of trick there in getting, uh, getting things there, making things there. So, so um, we wanted to get something. This samples at a certain rate of an air microphone for ultrasonic frequency. So, so we're doing things at 96 kilohertz. So we wanted to get the frames to go at least at the same rate of a sampling of the acoustics or so to see if we could see some of the things there. Um, and that's part of the motivation there. So and we looked at different uh, diameter spaces or that. So these are some of his slides I'll show the next uh, five minutes or so. There, he does a lot more of these um, visualizations uh, and more experimental things, but um, that was part of the reason I visited him. He, he does that. So we had these different regimes that no one had seen before. And one of this interesting one, which has acoustics is this liftoff regime. And this regime too here, where we get these instabilities no one had seen before um, and the breakup. So we have acoustic signatures and then um, a fluid hydrodynamic instabilities, which is something I've been interested in uh, uh, related to acoustics there that people hadn't seen before. So the standard thing is you have this hydrophobic surface and then you have the sphere go down, it undergoes a monopole, uh, I mean a prolate oblate, which is essentially like a monopole oscillation there. Uh, it's not quite least spherical and it lifts off the drop. So people, this isn't particularly exciting. So it pushes the drop away and lifts it off. It's gonna lift it off a little bit because um, it's a hydrophobic surface. But what, um, uh, happens there and, and there's no lift off. He has a lot of these, this is his slides from our APS talk uh, and another uh, conference there. It's a little bit like the, um, the drop stuff there. 
um, is, is a little bit like the ski movies or other movies or so. You know, you know, sometimes I prefer to have a little equations in between the movies, but uh, he has a lot of good movies. So the interesting thing here um, is we were able to see this acoustically uh, besides just in terms of the um, high speed uh, dynamics there. So we do get this signal as the contact microphone, which is a PCO there. We get this part of a deformation of the water bead there. And then we get the acoustic signal and there is no acoustic signal here. It just goes and lifts off. There's some hydrodynamics. Um, however, when we go to lift off, we bring up uh, a higher height for the same uh, parameter regime. We get something people had never seen before and I think is quite interesting. So we do get this regime. We're able to completely lift off uh, the hydrophobic uh, pool there. Um, and uh, in that uh, process of this uh, liftoff regime, no one had seen this before because they'd only really looked at um, spheres that were solid spheres or spheres that didn't deform this much. Um, uh, that deformation kind of scoops it up there. So it undergoes this uh, a prolate oblate uh, mode and then it scoops up the water there under the deformation there. So is greater and then the contact line pushes it up and leaves the surface. But what I was most interested in for motivating this experiment here is could you see this acoustically? So a lot of things in acoustics, what you do is you have air bubbles uh, collapse or so and that's an acoustic signature. But could you see that in air? And actually you can do it and I was very happy with or excited about this result. It's kind of more of a basic science result is it lifts it up but it entrains air and then that process actually is related to this entrainment of the air bubble, which collapses. So this is when it has this, and then it's forming this octopus shaped thing, as Taylor likes to call it there. And then this is the, actually the acoustic signature from the uh, microphone there where that air bubble collapses or so, and then it squirts out this jet. So um, you can see an air bubble there, um, uh, you know, off the surface there. So that's one uh, we had seen that, um, was pretty interesting. So um, it's forming this, um, and the formation of the structure is also something that's very interesting in terms of the hydrodynamics. This structure here, it's a reverse crown and then the air bubble collapses and it comes through there. So uh, so it's kind of a very basic science thing, but um, there are some applications or, or uh, some things related to hydrophobic surfaces. So we'll kind of finish up here in the next few minutes. I, this is stuff we're sending uh, to PRL or is in some process with PRL. As you go uh, um, higher there, you're going to get more of a surface sheet breakup. This is also another instability uh, that people haven't seen before. Um, here, it's kind of like a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, but it's driven by this uh, prolate oblate oscillation. But as you get higher in height, you also get some torsional modes to this viscoelastic sphere. So this creates a new regime uh, on the surface sheet. Um, in terms of this breakup. So this is very cool or something in terms of hydrodynamics instabilities. No one has seen that before. And then even more interesting to me is the fact that you can get acoustics to this. So we'll go through uh, on that part there. Okay, so here, this is, I think a really nice result. Um, I presented at the ASA and uh, Tad presented it at the APS uh, DFT meeting or so, is we actually get the um, signature there. So this is the signature of it leaving the surface and hitting the surface, the contact microphone. And then this is the acoustic air signature here. So this part, I believe, is, is it goes down and it forms a little cavitation bubble after it's starting to pull things up. And then the torsional mode of the sphere hits in there and it's forming another bubble. And this is similar but not quite as clean um, to the part that you've entrained some air. And then as you lift up the jet, these air bubbles start to collapse. So there are some interesting things uh, I'm more interested in than Tad or so, looking at the characteristics of these acoustic signals uh, more specifically um, uh, with some, a little bit of signal processing and relating it to these hydrodynamic instabilities. So this is something, um, um, that's also, you know, very interesting just from the basic uh, fluid mechanics and acoustics that goes with it in terms of um, instabilities and uh, signatures and understanding the breakup, because these are modes of an instability that no one had really seen before. I don't think anyone's seen before. There's one group in France that's done something similar, but uh, not as uh, rigorous as we've done in terms of the experiments. Okay, so those are some of the regimes. We'll kind of wind up there a little bit because we're running out of time. So a very high impact, you get even more of a drastic uh, uh, breakup or so, and then you get even more modes there. So, so that's also of interest um, to some 
you know, basic thing. So uh, hopefully we'll have this published and I'll be able to send out the publication there. It's taking a little while. Um, so we have one way to start to do these splashes or so. It's hard to get a lot of theory in there. Uh, the signal processing, I think we can do more with, but you can look at the regimes or scaling between the di diameter of the water bead to the diameter of the pool or so, and then the difference in heights. And you can try to classify these regimes on when it happens or so. So that's one thing people do for drop breakup is because it's a process is fairly complicated. So it's hard to do the beetle simulation in CFD, but as soon as you have breakup of particles and things like that, there's, there's really some limitation of what you can do in terms of simulations. And that's, but it's, you know, that's why some experimentalists go into it because you don't have to worry about simulations. You can, you know, get some cool pictures and, and do some interesting things there too. But, um, um, you know, there's some interesting, a lot of interesting things there in terms of the acoustics and hydrodynamics. So, uh, so this is kind of a summary there. And we do have one um, entry. We didn't, um, Tad's had a, um, a lot of uh, promise doing some of the things in terms of uh, gallery of fluids. Uh, we didn't win this year, but um, uh, I think we had some nice results there uh, in gallery of fluids. So this was presented last um, uh, fall at the um, uh, DFD meeting. Uh, Tad's student presented it, and then I also presented it at the ASA uh, last year. And this is one, uh, one of the things uh, I think it's close to coming out from my sabbatical that I started and did in my sabbatical there. Okay, so um, uh, so that's some other things there. So I'll end with his presentation. I went over a little bit, but um, if some, I kind of went over a bunch of topics and a bunch of things. Uh, uh, but I think they're, you know, there's a, they're related to acoustics and there's some practical things, but also some things that are uh, just of fundamental interest. So, um, so are there any uh, questions there? We have a uh, four or so minutes or five minutes or so for questions, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Professor Allen. Uh, any questions? Too many questions. <laughs> Too many questions. There. Yeah, it's a bunch yeah, of topics, I'll so I can give. I'll a, send you an email for sure. Yeah, yeah. So be sure to email me. So I want to give an overview because I do do things that are pretty broad. I mean, some of the things I do, like this last thing I showed, is. You know, there is some practical things, but it's also just kind of cool and scientific, which is fine, I think, especially do for your, your sabbatical. But then there are some things like the coconut rhinoceros beetle, the governor, when I gave that, came up and said, oh, you're doing a good job on that. I said, oh, thank you. So, um, you know, those things are, are interesting, but also practical, uh, uh, important. So I think you want to do a balance, or, or at least my take is you want to have some balance between things that are just interest you're interested in, and then things that, you know, you got to pay the bills and, and uh, do some important things. And that's part of engineering too. So, so that's kind of my take. Different people have different emphasis, but. Uh. So there's a one question. Um, I guess, John, can you read? Uh, the okay, let me see. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, let's see, chat? Okay. Yeah. Okay, chat three. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's a good, uh, a good question. So that is kind of a basic study, but Tad does have funding from uh, ONR and some companies are the fact that we make these coatings, these hydrophobic coatings, and uh, they're able to repel water. So that's a test of, of, in some ways, you may have more like raindrops or drop on drop I've shown of how these coatings hold up. So hydrophobic coatings are a big uh, important thing. The other thing which I didn't show, which I worked at, at with his lab is another paper, perhaps a little more practical is water entry. So the Navy is really interested in reducing sounds for water entry and you know, you're throwing things, you have projectiles in the water. That's where most of his funding comes from. And I visited Newick um, in Newport, um, Rhode Island, where um, as an ONR fellow, partially a sabbatical too, is, um, you know, water entry or so. So can you use coatings to reduce sound and and uh, level of drag and water entry? And then hydrophobic coatings are very interesting for a lot of practical applications. This study is a little bit more of a basic study, but um, you know, there are some implications there on understanding acoustics as a detection method for uh, these hydrophobic coatings. Um, John, so I have a question. Um, yeah. What's the um, um, hydrophobic surface you studied on? Yeah, so we used uh, a special secret formula, which he has, uh, which is still secret. I kind of know like Coke. Oh. But, but then we also use Glockamere and WDX100, uh, which are 
commercial ones you can buy or so. So Glockamere works very well, and that's kind of a standard for most uh, research or so. It's a Japanese thing. You can buy it actually on Amazon. It's a little expensive, so, but you can do uh, it. Is it, is it similar to like Cytob and uh, Teflon? Family? Yeah, yeah. It's a similar kind of idea. It's similar to like you spray the thing on your windshield so it doesn't beat up, but it's it's much more advanced or so. So there's the old things like Rain-X you may have seen. You know, you, you have those, but now in the last five, 10 years, that's why uh, it's become more interesting. There's much more, more effective coatings. One, they last longer and then you don't need as much and they have uh, improved contact angles or so. So some of the things which we did in that experiment or so are things that are just commercially available. There are some secret yeah. ones uh, um, that he gets from chemists, kind of like the Yizhou, but his, not uh, Yizhou, but other people in that field where they're making secret special ones. Um, but you know, it's not clear those are that much better or that much at this point than the ones that are now commercially available. So, so for the impact study, um, what's the so? Do you know the roughness of the surface? I mean, does it matter at all? Yeah, it does matter with the roughness. So we had that characterized. So we did it both on surfaces. I didn't show you that were characterized in terms of roughness, but I wanted to see if we could see. This is kind of interesting for some of maybe your energy harvesting thing or raindrops. I've looked at is can you measure something about the impact with the contact microphone? So do you are you able? And we measured that too. That's a custom-made contact microphone I had made uh, for it. So can we get something about the impact and the force with the piezoelectric element? Um, and that stuff I worked on, and I've talked to a grad student here recently, someone from Reader Water Resources, I guess he works for the director, he said, I showed him some of this, uh, we were just talking uh, before the COVID thing, and he says, that would be interesting uh, for raindrop sounds. So can you quantify raindrop sounds or rain sounds um, doing something like that? And um, I haven't followed up with that with COVID, but I think that's a, a potentially a pr practical application is, is understanding raindrop sounds with uh, a better contact microphone or, you know, a piezoelastic force plate or so. The problem with most of the force plates, I've looked at these a little bit, is they get these vibrations of the plate as opposed to the vibrations of the impact. So there's a little bit of filtering and things there, yeah. but that's an that's interesting uh, application field. So there are two more questions in the chat. Can you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Is it possible to characterize the different regimes? Yeah. Um, is the location where you put the contact microphone? Yes, it is important. We don't know exactly where it is there. And, and I'm trying to get back on that um, application there. But in our lab studies in the quarantine area, it does make a difference where you put it. Uh, we had a, had a coconut thing and we looked at them burring there. We don't know exactly where it is, but that's an interesting problem there. Can we connect a contact microphone to a microcontroller? Yes, there's been some work with that. What I did is I have custom contact microphones like the one I used in this study and then commercial ones. And usually they go to an A to D, um, something you have to get from A to D, and then you can either have a lab view or you can use a commercial A to D thing and put it on your laptop with something like Audacity. Um, but yeah, you can get them with microcontrollers and I'm happy to talk to you about that. And, and Dan's actually working on that now with me. Um, All right, any, um, any other questions? Maybe one more. Um, okay, let's see. Hey, Dr. Allen, I have yeah. just one question. So, yeah. you know the rhinoceros beetle that you have for your setup for with the microphones and stuff? Like, yes. how did you guys uh, get the beetle to like just hang there? I'm assuming glue, right? I'm not no, it's a it's a magnet with special types of glue or something. So, so uh, we have a we actually went for you know these things that seem trivial in biological experiments are actually quite tedious. So, so it's kind of you know it's like. The diving thing, you know, I hadn't dived since high school or something. You just there's a there's a level of complexity for scientific diving, and there it's a level of complexity of getting organisms to do what you want. So we had to use two magnets and a special type of glue, and we went through five different glues to find one that would actually hold it. So some of the ones that actually flew off because the glue wasn't strong enough for the beetle. So these are the strong. There's the dung beetle which you may see makes this big bowl thing. And then there's this beetle. And apparently these are the strongest beetles on earth. Um, um, so, so there is a lot of little tricks and things there to do it uh, with biological organisms. But good question. Those are important things of engineering. The same thing students at other things you do. It always looks good conceptually when you actually start to do it you know, with experiments. You know, there's all these uh, small things that, that um, you, know, you have to deal with um, that can be interesting, but also challenging. Thank you. So, yeah, so if you're interested in the dive, I know for free. Yeah, so you have to go. I'm, 
hopefully, so what directions can we go in terms of the college too? I might wind up with there. So architectural acoustics, I know people, I don't do that field as much, but if we're working with the School of Architecture, we certainly could have good interactions. And I know people on the mainland in architectural schools who are prominent and that would be good. So if we're trying to set things up for ocean uh, diving and other things, there's a level, I know Dave Pence, I know Tim Trikas, those are both friends of mine. Dave is a dive master of the university and Tim Trikas is a zoology uh, professor who does a lot of underwater fish acoustics. So, you know, that's something we have to think about and, and do, but you have to go through set, certain levels of university certification to do scientific diving and there's also some other regulations there. So I've had my postdocs do it and one graduate student, but um, uh, Dave Pence is the one to talk to for that. So, so um, that's something certainly when we were, if we're working with ocean engineering in a program, uh, we would like to get uh, going or, or I could help coordinate or so. So I'm kind of now out of the water, but um, this is an important thing for, for ocean uh, research. All right, I guess, uh, so our time is up. Uh, okay, really, I went over Thank you, uh, Dr. Allen. Um, I guess uh, you may have more questions. Please feel free to contact him uh, directly. So let's um, thank him again, and um, I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity, and feel free to email me. Um, I'm usually available. So, so. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you.